So today we are going to speak about the activities of the Supreme Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He appeared as the son of Sachi Devi and Jagannath Mishra. I was asked to speak on the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. So we'll do that. So Lord Chaitanya has appeared in his baby form. And uh, Mother Sachi, who is none other than the combined incarnation of uh, Mother Yashoda and Mother Devaki, she is also having the potency of Mother Kaushalya plus she is also manifesting the Shakti or the energy of Aditi, the mother of the, mother of the demigods. So this is Mother Sachi. So Mother Sachi has just seen the beautiful form of her child. And she is extremely happy. So Chaitanya is not, is just a baby right now. So what has happened is that the town in which Lord Chaitanya appeared, Navadvip, by the arrangement of providence or we can say 
by the Lord Chaitanya's own arrangement. The whole town is chanting the holy names of the Lord. The devotees are chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And those who are not devotees, some of them being surrounded by so many people chanting Hare Krishna. They wanting to be a part of the crowd. Some of them a little concerned. Others in a joking way. They also chant Hare Krishna. You know, so just as we see devotees go on. Have you seen videos of the Hare Krishna devotees doing Hare Nam Sankirtan on the streets? Yes. Some, some of those uh, video clips. You see the devotee walk up to a stranger and say, Can you say the name of Lord Gauranga? Or can you say Hare Krishna? And the person is like, Yeah, I don't care. Mm. And says, Yeah, okay, Krishna or Gauranga. And all the devotees and all those instruments, they just go crazy. So that makes a person feel very important, like, oh, maybe I did something really good. So many people are happy. So something like that was happening in Naruti. The non-believers, they just went along with the crowd. There were a lot of people who were simply pious. So they were also chanting the holy names of the Lord. The reason being, it was the lunar eclipse. So what happens in the lunar eclipse? Who cares? That is our attitude right now. Or maybe because eclipse, grahan, we've heard something about it. It's not very healthy or auspicious. So, there may be a, a little inclination, just a slight inclination to know about eclipses. How many of you actually understand the uh, Jyotisha concept of eclipse? Not many. We are all you know, educated people. We don't deal with such subject matters. <laughs> It is usually considered inauspicious. That is true. And that is where our knowledge begins and it ends. <laughs> <laughs> Most probably in today's times, this generation, at least this generation knows that it is inauspicious. The next generation is like, what the hell is Grahan? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Eclipse. Okay. <laughs> so, what about it? <laughs> So why, why has that happened? Why has that happened? It has happened because many of us have only subscribed to a limited section of the scriptures. I don't bite. <laughs> so, People can come up ahead if they want them. I think all the newcomers come to them. Please come back. Please come back. Yeah. I think all the newcomers need to sell them. Yeah, I'm a certified decent person. <laughs> <laughs> so you can come close. <laughs> so, um, eclipse. So, a little science. The sun's rays. 
has a lot of energy, different forms, photons, you know that, right? And photons are of different, um, what does it call as? Frequencies, different frequencies. Not all the frequencies, frequency, uh, photons of all frequencies are not healthy. So somebody with maybe a big beard, big hair, who did not have any degree from Harvard or even from a basic rudimentary engineering college, somebody from that time, decided to do some research on these different energy patterns. So during an eclipse, the Earth being a very huge uh, celestial body, does not receive the direct rays of the sun. The rays of the sun, or to be more specific, the photons, the various frequencies of light that reach the earth are transformed. That transformation is A little, uh, let us say, bad or unhealthy. Specifically, that energy is absorbed by elements, by um, liquids, or food that has been transformed through cooking, or even humans. Especially if somebody is having some skin issues or otherwise, those radiations are unhealthy. So I have no idea why they did that, how they figured it out, but someone there seems to be uh, very observant, someone in the past. And they noted down, noted it down, and they said, when an eclipse happens, try not to eat anything, especially cooked food. Try not to drink stored water. And as far as possible, sanitize yourself and your surroundings once the eclipse is over. The reason being that through such sanitization, at least the superficial absorption, you know, when, when those frequencies have been absorbed superficially on various surfaces, at least that is dispelled. That is the concept of it being inauspicious. Now then there are these stories that during an eclipse, somebody had a miscarriage during an eclipse, Somebody saw ghosts during an eclipse, something else happened, somebody went a little crazy. But there are coincidences. Thus, if I hit you with a direct light, I know if I just kind of put a flashlight in your eyes, you're going to give a reaction. It's typical. So light does affect you, it does directly affect your but functioning of the brain. It gives, the brain gives some response. There's a nervous response. And today's times, because we educated people, we kind of connect the dots. But basically, what it means is that we understand this phenomena in a language that we have learned to communicate. Previously, previous generations, just one word, inauspicious, carried all this meaning that we just now explained. Maybe that is how I'm trying to understand why the members of society in the yesteryears, how, why would they accept this? Were they all dumb people? I mean, understand until that they were really cave dwellers. <laughs> doesn't seem like that. So 500 years ago, it seems that people were 
they have some understanding of culture, some understanding of philosophy, some understanding of life sciences, good enough understanding. Architecture, engineering, if you look at the constructs from those times, the constructions, we can, we can understand that, yeah. So there was some global awareness. Hence, during an eclipse, you're supposed to be a little careful. And even in today's times, that holds true. It does hold true. <clears throat> There's no need to be scared about it. It is not something like a holocaust. It is not doomsday. But it has some effect in a, or it, it, it affects us in a negative way. So what do people do? What was their uh, way out from an eclipse? So the Chaitanya uh, Charitamrit and the Chaitanya Bhagavad, these are two uh, prominent biographies that we in ISKCON use to understand the activities of Lord Chaitanya. It describes that all the adults and children who were of a responsible age, they have all immersed themselves waist high or chest deep in the river Ganges. The reason being a flowing river carries away the radiations. That is a, that, it's a simple science, basically, a simple logic. So the glacial waters are melting, the river is flowing, and it carries away everything downstream till the ocean. So that is why everyone goes to a river. And those who are not able to reach a river, if they have an ocean nearby, then they enter the ocean and immerse themselves waist deep. The idea is less body surface is exposed to the radiations. Simple. Then why do they chant the Lord's holy names? Because they have nothing better to do. What should they chant, you know? Uh, go Chicago Bears or something like that? Mm -hmm. Chicago Bulls, not Bears. So, uh, they feel that why not use the, our tongue and our time to chant the holy names of the Lord? Right? We don't, we don't chant the names of the Lord any other time. So at least we can say, see Krishna. We did it. See it. Oh Lord. We are not wasting time. You know how, how the human mind works. If you tell someone that why don't you chant the names of the Lord every day? Can I do it while I'm brushing my teeth? Sure. <laughs> why not? But would it, would it hurt you too much to do it just by itself? The, the act by itself? You mean just, just sit down and chant? Isn't that a waste of time? It would be so nice to multitask. As I said, we are all educated, so what can we do? Being educated, we would like to make optimal use of our time, isn't it? And, and remembering the Supreme Lord is like the last priority. When you're done with everything else, because everything else is also service to the Lord. So when you're done with everything else, then you can sit down and chant the Lord's names. Okay. It's like when you're, when you're done with all paying all your bills, then sit down and do your taxes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to be a little more broad minded, I'd say. The reason I'm saying a little more broad minded because we must. And give the Supreme Lord a 
slightly elevated position in our lives, a little bit. But yeah, you can have that space, you know. Maybe the VIP space in my life. Just a thought, think about it. There's no force. Hmm. After all, it gives us air to breathe, it gives us the ability to see. We do have eyes, but then he creates a situation where we can see. If he had, if, if we were on the other side of the moon, the dark side, what would you do with his eyes? Night vision? <laughs> it does give us the ability to see, does give us the ability to breathe, does give us the ability to speak and interact. You owe him at least this little bit, a little bit. And yeah, I think so. This person is important in my life. Maybe a very important person. There, you take your seat. Life is strange, isn't it? How strange is it? When we have a first child, you're yeah, like, this is the most important day of my life. That is on social media. This is the best moment, something really good that has happened to me, you know, so on and so forth. It's good emotions. 30 days, a month down the line, and you have to go back to work. Oh, maybe we have paternity leaves now and maternity leaves. So maybe six months down the line, you have to go to work. This sounds like the an ice cream vendor. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> But if I had been really a good devotee, you know what I would have done as it was training? I would have said Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. So, uh, Krishna can have that space, that place. So six months down the line, you go back to work. Somebody has to pay for the bills, right? So go to work. And what happens to the most important thing in your life? Time changes that. That's how life is funny, isn't it? So on, the only time you can engage with the most important person in your life is before you go to work and after you come back. And kind of you can just keep the picture of that baby on your work desk. Hey baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's life. Correct? Now, if that happens with someone that is so dear to us, Krishna is like far away dear to us. <laughs> so, it's quite possible that we don't forget to engage with him on a daily basis. But we should try. That is all that is being asked. That we should try. We should not give up, give up trying. So, 
during the eclipse because they were all there in the river, they, they had nothing better to do. So being those who are devotees, they are chanting Hare Krishna. Those who are non-believers, it's the eclipse. That's more important than any other world event. Even if the stock market crashes during the eclipse, you're not going to stand and waste deep water and talk about Dow's uh, the American stock exchange. No. You're not going to do it. You're going to just, okay, yeah, eclipse. Hey, so you're also here, huh? Uh, yeah. That's all you're going to do. And then all around you, there are these believers who are chanting Hare Krishna. So they also kind of just join the bandwagon. That is what happened. Advaita Acharya, Haridas Thakur, these two gentlemen, they were at Advaita Acharya's house, which is some distance from Jagannath Mishra's house, walking distance. They were dancing in joy. They're not just joyful, they were dancing in joy. And these were senior citizens, like they had, they had earned their retirement, enough social security. So they did not have to work anymore for their insurance. And yeah, that's how elderly they were. They started chanting, not just chanting, they were dancing in joy. And the reason was they had never in their entire life, they had lived their entire life in Nagati and they had never ever seen this happen. The whole town was reverberating with the sounds of the holy names of Krishna. And the smile on the faces was like from year to year. And they immediately went to the river Ganga. And there they joined the, those multitudes of people chanting Hare Krishna. And while he was there, Advaita Acharya in his mind, he offered charity. He was like, I would like to give $10,000 to every single person in my community, in my village, as charity. And I would like to donate a house to every single person in Frisco. <laughs> Play now. It's so tough now. <laughs> in your mind, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> See, we are so miserly. <laughs> Even in our mind, we are kind of worrying that oh, it's so difficult. <laughs> what has happened to us, people? <laughs> Wake up. Mentally, we can do that. That is what Adhita Acharya was doing. And he was thinking that, let me go at least a million stocks of Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> To every single person in my village. Donate. And that's how about somehow the other he hacked into his mental thoughts. Somehow backdoor Trojan. <laughs> <laughs> he started smiling. He said, something is going on. Something is going on with all of this happiness and all of this charity. Do you think it's Krishna consciousness is always serious, being serious? There's a lot of fun. Two gentlemen and Haridas Thakur passing of snide remarks. <laughs> mm, something is going on here. Adwaita Acharya is too blissful to even notice. Shiva's Thakur is joined by Acharya Ratna. Acharya Ratna is one of, there is a distant relative of Lord Chaitanya, a maternal uncle. He's also called as Chandra, Chandra Shekhar Acharya. Lovingly, people would call him Acharya Ratna. 
they also come to the river Ganga. And they also take a bath. They immerse themselves. Till the eclipse is over. Generally, the lunar eclipse main phase, this one was a couple of, uh, maybe just about an hour. Jagannath Mishra is very happy. I have a son born to me. His elder son, Vishwarup, is very happy. The news spreads. Jagannath Mishra has a new ball. So people come out of the river Ganga. Hundreds and thousands of them. And they all go to the house of Jagannath Mishra to wish Jagannath Mishra. Jagannath Mishra welcomes all of them. But the culture is that when you go to another's house, you do potluck. <laughs> it could be food, it could be anything else. There's exchange of gifts. So people took some gifts along with them to Jagannath Mishra's house to wish him congratulate him. Jagannath Vishwa received them with a lot of respect and joy. He received their gifts and he offered them gifts in return. Now he wasn't really a very rich man. So after some time, his bank balance was zero. Just like in half an hour or so. His possessions were all gone because he had donated all of them, but he had received a lot in return. Or he had received a lot of gifts. So those guests who came later on, when he received gifts from them, he offered them that which he had received as gifts. He offered that in return to them. There's always a desire to know what you've received, right? What's in this package? Can I use an x-ray machine? <laughs> Being satisfied is a very, very healthy yet rare trade in human society today. Is it or is it not? Yes. Very much. Very much? All right, on the scale of one to 10. <laughs> it's a rare gift quality available in today's times, isn't it? Being satisfied. My friend once told me that he had gone to visit someone. He knocked on the, on the door. And it was open, the door was opened by a stranger. He said, who are you? The stranger goes, who are you, sir? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought, uh, this is such and such person's house. He says, no, sorry. You got the wrong house. You know what was his reaction? Because you have, all of us have phones, right? Right there, he takes out his phone, dials his friends down. He's like, why did you give me the wrong address? Hmm. Why does that happen? There's always a possibility that we can kind of just call them and say, hey, I'm at the wrong house. Could you send me the proper address? I think I made a mistake. The closer you are to a person, you feel you're more authorized to give it back. Is it true? And then we call it very healthy relationship. <laughs> <laughs> the slightest of things can disturb us. So there is a question of being satisfied. So what do we do? How do we learn to be a little more patient in our lives? 
go to the inpatient department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not the outpatient. <laughs> the inpatient department, what is it? Breathe in, relax. <laughs> Breathe out, relax. And you want. <laughs> Well, I have money, so it seems nice to spend money on such things, right? Mm -hmm. And our elderly parents since our early childhood would tell us the same thing. Sham, Sham. Breathe in, breathe out. And they say, why are you telling me? Why don't you tell that other person? But now as earning members of society, I joined this. I joined this event. I joined this club. What do you do? Breathe in, relax, breathe out, relax. <laughs> and I have a coach. <laughs> they teach me how the spine has to be erect as you breathe in and relax. It's needed. Have you ever wondered that how did we land up in a place where such simple things are needed in our life? Why have we, what have we made of ourselves? What did we do to ourselves? And why did we do that to ourselves? Where was our rational brain, rational mind? What was it doing? Was it on a vacation in Florida? Or maybe our brain was stuck, struck by the pandemic. The rational mind, sorry, I'm under lockdown. <laughs> 20 years of, or 30 years of allowing toxins to stay as our friends in our own body and mind, and then we go on a detox moment. How is that, how is it that we allow ourselves to be abused by us? The animals, when they feel that there is something wrong with them, they know what they have to do. They just, if they, if they know that, if they uh, know what can counteract that toxin, they go searching for it and get it done. How about us? I have money. I have the facility. I can get any kind of treatment, any kind of facility, because I have. But sir, madam, why are you abusing yourself so much? Why do you let your mind be polluted so much? What do you mean? It's not me, it's the neighbors. They say things, they do things. I get angry, I get nervous. And you know what the strange thing is? The neighbor is saying the same thing about us. <laughs> it's a wonderful world. So what should we do? Self-restraint is important. Self-restraint doesn't mean that we become non-violent or we become, uh, you know, upholders of a non-violent movement of society. That is not self-restraint. That is simply a reaction to something that has already challenged our existence. Just a reaction. What is self-restraint? Self-restraint means I'm not here to abuse myself, this body that I have. My existence is not meant to pollute my mind. I need this body. I need this mind. These are wonderful serving vehicles for me to go and reach a particular destination. Who does that? Krishna is asking Arjuna the same question. Arjuna, who does that? Arjuna is, I don't have time for all of this philosophy. Please tell me. You have to agree that I am not going to fight. You have to 
give your approval stamp, approval stamp to my decision, you know. Krishna is like, where is self-restraint, Arjuna? Arjun, Krishna, can't you see I'm trembling, I'm shivering, I'm sweating, and my mind is like in shambles? Krishna is like, oh my God. I'm not getting through this cloud of ignorance. So he does the one thing that any surgeon would do. Cuts him open. Open surgery. Where has all this impurity come into you, Arjun? You're supposed to follow the path of righteousness. You're an Arya. And Arjuna is like, oh, that was sharp. <laughs> That was intense. Arjuna's ego or his idea of what his egoistic existence, that was being pierced by Krishna. How is it that this has come upon you, Arjuna? And Arjuna is like, can we open up a private window on Zoom? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a different room, please? In front of everybody. Now he was ready to hear. Therefore, we need we need such interaction in our lives. We need somebody who can cut through the various layers of egotistic existences that we have created for ourselves. Hence, self-restraint is very important. And when there is self-restraint, there is tolerance. Then you are able to tolerate heat, cold, anger, honor, dishonor. And Srila Prabhupada's words, in very simple words, he said, Who am I and what is the goal of your life? Who are you? If, let's say, I am a, I'm on a visitor's visa, wouldn't I exert some kind of self-restraint in, in a different country? Wouldn't I kind of want to know what their laws are, understand that, be a little more perceptive? Yes, I would. So who are you? What is your identity? So many people here, they're like, yeah, we are spirit soul. We heard, we heard that in 1982. We've been around for quite some time. So who are you? Somebody who likes Krishna. You'll always see me there, Prashad time. <laughs> I mean, miss everything else, but not Prashad. So who are you, Prasad lover? Oh. <laughs> who are you? I'm always there when they want me to do Kirtan, and if somebody else is doing, I'm out. Who are you? A Kirtan lover, a Kirtan doer? No. Again, ask the question, who are you? So it's a simple question. The answer to this question is quite revolutionary. There's only one answer. There cannot be any other answer. Who are you? Who am I? There's only one answer. The answer is, I am a servant, not a spirit soul. I am a servant of Krishna. Since Krishna is a spirit soul, hence I am also a spirit soul. The difference is, he is a supreme spirit soul and is part and parcel. Does that make sense? Serve. And then, can a servant be a prasad lover? <laughs> a servant has to be a prasad server. Can a servant be a kirtan doer? A servant is a kirtan facilitator. Can a servant be a person giving discourses? 
A servant is a person who understands what is needed by the audience and tries to help them receive that. So who are you? Who am I? Servant. Yeah, all right, see. Oh my god. <laughs> 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 he is the only person that is listening, listening so serious. <laughs> 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 yeah. Who are you? I'm serious. <laughs> I said, seriously, who are you? <laughs> 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 Siri never sleeps. <laughs> so, servant. So, those who understand that they are servants, they know the art of being satisfied. And if we miss out on the realization of service, then we may have the up and down graph, you know, like the heart rate, the drop and the crest, the drop and the crest, the up, the down, the up, the down. Uh, yesterday I was so relaxed when I was in this program. Or I still remember a year ago, but that was so nice. So there's the up. And what about now? Oh, I wish I could just not go to work anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's how a satisfaction graph is. It's been like that since many years. The most prob probably it will continue like that unless and until we consciously decide to do something different. So if my life is like the doldrums, I'm still a servant. If my life is like on a high trajectory, I'm still a servant. Just because I'm there and every else, everyone else is holding me in high esteem, does it stop making me stop? Does, do I stop being a servant? No, that is delusion. And if I've been rejected by everyone, by all possibilities, do I lose my potential existence as a servant? Never. Because na mariyate So soul is never born, nor can it kill ever. So <clears throat> Jagannath Mishra was given all of these gifts and he had no idea what he had received. He trusted all the guests who had come that they were giving that which was maybe beneficial. That was a kind of trust that no one would be playing pranks on him because when he passes on this gift to somebody else, it shouldn't be an empty box. People don't do that. And then everyone was satisfied. Then Jagannath Mishra, he went to see the beautiful form of his son. And he had facilitated everyone else, facilitated their desire. After that, he went to look at his son. I don't want to make any comments here. I leave that in the air for everyone to meditate. <laughs> See this beautiful son. He's so happy. A lady is come visiting. In India, especially during such events, 
in the bygone days, nowadays it's, you don't see that so much, but in the bygone days, when I say bygone, I mean when our generation, when we were children, we have seen that. When the ladies come for any particular function, it could be an event or it could be an occasion, something, and they, when they visit any house, the local ladies. <clears throat> That is a festival. They come in their best of dresses. They are very happy, joyful. They come with so many auspicious items. Chaitanya Charitamrit says that they come with Sindur, Vermilion, they come with Harda or Haritra. Um, any, any word is, it basically means turmeric. Why? These are all auspicious items, plus these are all minerals that give you strength and immunity. In the raw uh, element, uh, raw existence, they actually give, they're supposed to, they have this, this uh, they're like immune boosters. In those times, that, that is how, those are the facilities that they had. And then they got some khai, fused rice, as Shri Prabhupada translates it. Some paddy to offer to the child. Jagannath Mishra moved out, but the ladies take over the room. Sachi Devi, she saw all these ladies. It gave her so much strength. Because it was like her community people are there, you know, women with women. She, they could have girl talk, basically. So she felt so happy having all these ladies around. And the ladies were like, some of them were treating her as their own daughter, some of them were treating her as their friend, some of them were uh, very happy because they were quite young. And they asked her, are you okay? Everything is all right. And she's like, yes, everything is okay. Please bless my child. Amongst them, there were a lot of ladies that she was kind of, she felt she was seeing them for the first time. They looked so gentle. Their appearance was so very, um, it had such a calming effect. That in her heart, she felt very happy seeing strangers there. And Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami says, some of them, amongst them, was Savitri. Savitri Devi. There was Gauri Devi who had come. Saraswati Devi had come. Arundhati Devi had come. Rambha had come. These are all great personalities revered in the Vedic um, custom, revered. For us, I mean, it would be nice if uh, most probably, no. what would happen if a child is just born and ladies like, uh, let's say, Kamala Harris would come. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and some of you may not like her, you may like Ali Abhat, so maybe she comes. <laughs> you may like her better. Still. <laughs> somebody who, who you revere much. Now, for many generations, like for thousands of years, these ladies have been revered by every generation of people in the Vedic custom till the 20th and 21st century. In the 20th century, there was some reverence for that. In the 21st century, there are simply names in books. 
How did that happen? Oh, we are all educated here. We are all educated people. So we deleted out irrelevant portions of our history that had been preserved for thousands of years. We just deleted, deleted that away. Now what happens? So who are the personalities that we revere so much? Our grandmother, our mother, just the ladies I'm talking about, or my boss, lady boss. If, if our lady boss pays a visit to the maternity home, say, thank you for coming, Sarah. It was very kind of you. And then we read, maybe Savitri Devi is coming. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> Who's Savitri? Savitri is the wife of Brahma. Who's Brahma? A four-headed person? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it is so irrelevant. We have to try to see if we can again make these aspects of scriptures relevant in our lives. And how can we do that? What does Savitri do? What is the, the uh, importance of Savitri in our life? Do you know what is the importance of Savitri in our life? The early morning time is also known as Savitri. Did you know that? Why? Because the night the darkness of the night is now being engulfed by the sun's brightness. And that is Savitri or Savitri or Savita. You heard the word Savita? Yeah. Have you ever, nowadays obviously we no longer name our children Savita. We would like to just name our children a girl child Radha. Savita is like, who the hell is, what is the hell is Savita? Savita means that moment, that time where darkness is driven away by light. Is that helpful? So we could say Savita is an expansion of Radharani. That is Savitri. What is the relationship with Brahma? Brahma is the is a person who kind of he is the Steve Jobs or the, I don't know, what is Wozniak of, of uh, Bob Wozniak of what system? What did he develop? What did he create? He was the co-founder of Apple. Co-founder of Apple. So Brahma is the co-founder, not the co-founder, the only founder of this world. <laughs> so he has a blueprint. His wife comes visiting. Wouldn't we be excited? <laughs> How's Brahmaji doing? <laughs> Do you think I can have a position there? Because <laughs> Brahma, the co-founder of this creation, no, the founder of this creation is there. And there is Gauri. It's not Gauri Kumar. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Gauri Kumar. <laughs> Gauri, Lord Shiva's consort. What is she doing there? She's come to give blessings. To whom? To herself. Because her Lord, her Master, the Supreme Lord has appeared, incarnated. But also, she is a mother. So she has come to give blessings to the child. Gauri is there. Saraswati is there. They come. Mother Sachi doesn't realize, she cannot understand that these ladies have, all, have also come there. So how does Krishna ask Kaviraj Goswami you know? I don't know if you ask him. But he says that this is what happened. I'm just repeating his words. So they, they also came to visit the Lord. And then Aditi appeared. Who Aditi? What's Aditi? Come on. <laughs> Who's Aditi? 
Yes. And for the demigods. The primary demigods. The primary demigods. And they are? Mm -hmm. Interesting. That's good. That's good. <laughs> Primarily, she is the mother of Indra. This creation. She is also the mother of the Adityas. One of the Adityas is the sun god. There are others. Primarily, 12 of them. She comes visiting. She looks at the child. She has come with auspicious items. Some paddy. Why is paddy auspicious? Have you ever seen, not paddy fields, but paddy data that has been collected from the fields? Have you ever seen a storehouse, a, a granary with uh, cut paddy? How many of you have seen? Do you know that it never goes bad unless until it's a little mushy and damp? Do you know that? Paddy never goes bad. But when you extract the grains from it and you store them, then the grains may go bad. Paddy never does that. So it's one of the most immune or resistant forms of existence that is healthy. It's like when a child is born, you say, okay, have you taken the vaccines? <laughs> so that is Aditi. She has come with the vaccine shots, Paddy. I shouldn't make it so simple, right? <laughs> Otherwise, people would think that I'm dramatizing or simplifying things, or simplifying them. But Paddy, that is it. So she comes with that. And Sachi Devi, finds herself being subservient to whatever she does. She's happy being subservient. She's like, yeah, you can do whatever you want with my child. She's, she's feeling so safe. So she comes and she offers Paddy at the feet of the Lord. She touches the Lord's ears and his senses with Paddy and she offers a prayer. Please stay here long enough. And she has her own selfish desire in that prayer because she knows if he stays, my children are safe. Because Krishna comes to protect. And then he goes for his servants. So this is a mother's prayer. Please stay here. May you have a long life. Such is like, wow. Who did I give birth to? What is this child? So many amazing things are happening to me. So many amazing things are happening in this room. She looks around and then she looks at her, at her child, and everything is erased. All these realizations simply vanish. She looks at the child. This is my sweet child. Let me hug him. Let me nourish him. And then she looks at, and again, there are visitors, and she looks at some of those visitors. They are like the denizens from other planets. A great personality has been born here. So she's kind of oscillating between. This understanding that something very, very important has happened in her life and the pure affection that she feels for her child.
The ladies offer their blessings and they leave. After a few days, according to the custom in those times, she has finished her maternity stay and now she can come out of the room. She comes out of the room and goes to take her ceremonial bath in the river Ganga. And all the ladies accompany her. She takes a bath there. She offers a lot of gifts, auspicious items to the ladies according to their, their marital status. Whether they're married or not, she offers them so many auspicious items. They all either give her their best wishes or their blessings. Then she comes back as soon as she can to her son. At that time, which is about the fifth or the sixth day since birth, see she, she sees her child trying to turn over. This is called as Uthan. In today's times, these may not seem very relevant because everything is kind of, it has become very external. But in those days, they would notice, is the child trying to raise itself? Because that shows that the spine and the anti-gravity muscles are developing. And it's called Uthan. It's a huge celebration. So they see that a child is trying a little bit to turn. And the child does that. The feet, the legs, the little legs, these tiny, tiny legs, they move. And the soul comes up. And she looks at that. And she calls her husband. These signs on the sole of his feet are amazing. What are they? Jagannath Mishra looks at all those markings and is like, they are amazing. I have no idea what they are. <laughs> Nilambar Chakravarti is visiting. He looks at this, all those markings and said, on the day you gave birth, I had said, I was there, I had looked at the astrological chart and it said, this is a very great personality. This person is a fit leader. This person is going to take on the responsibility of the entire creation, create auspiciousness, remove the burden of the entire world, help people realize their potential. So many things he had said. I had said all of that based on the astrological calculations today that has been confirmed when I see the markings on his feet. Jagannath Mishra and Sachin Devi is like, tell us more. Don't stop there. Tell us more. We are eager to hear more. Looking at the physiognomy of this child, looking at the various limb formations and the bodily features and specifically these markings. I can see here there's a thunderbolt. There is a flag, the dhaja is there, the vajra is there, the meena is there, the chakra is there, the gada is there. These are all auspicious markings on the soul of great personalities. Many times when people, uh, after uh, we have given this presentation, people remember a lot of people go back home and check their own the markings on their own feet. Like, is there a Veda somewhere here? <laughs> is there a club? <laughs> Maybe this this looks like a club. Some of them actually called me called me up and said, Ruby, how does a club look like? <laughs> it looks like a club. <laughs> so can I send you a picture of <laughs> I said you can, but I have no idea how it actually looks as a marking on your feet. You need someone who's well-read, well-studied in these aspects. It's really interesting how people immediately want to have everything auspicious in their lives. I've rarely seen someone go to the neighbor's place and like, can I check the sole of your feet or its markings? 
that kind of never happens it's like me and mine janasya mohoyam aham mamedi the entire world is simply enamored by the concept of i and mine isn't it most of the uh, members of today's congregation here do you all know each other do you all know each other yes let's say uh, two different families from this congregation on their own travel to florida and they decide to visit the miami temple one family lands up at the temple at 2 past 11 in the morning they like oh god in that there are certain other devotees there a couple of other devotees couple of other people in the temple hall everyone is a stranger right everyone is a stranger and at 10 past 11 as they are trying to make their way out the second family enters what happens what is the reaction <gasps> mine my people <laughs> my people are here and what about the rest of the <laughs> people that are there in the temple <laughs> they may be <laughs> they are somebody like so the whole world is enamored by this concept concept of i am my only the great personalities they kind of go beyond that and they look at the entire world as theirs this god is also deva kutumbakam so markings and then he said i think we should do the namakaran the name giving ceremony you should do that so this was about the third or the fourth one since the birth then they do the name giving ceremony the ladies they all come in and especially sita devi the wife of advaita acharya she comes she comes with so many ornaments for the child bangles and anklets and waist belt and cloth maybe she should just have gone to costco and go and bought a crib for the child <laughs> she is like from another age <laughs> it's much more easier cause goes in what do you need diapers yeah <laughs> so why would they get all those all of those ornaments especially the golden ornaments you see a child is very susceptible to vibrations around him because as of yet a child is not used to the environment around it very very susceptible to baby when you have gold ornaments and you have these various decorations what would you do if you if you go and visit someone and they have so many ornaments on their body what would be your reaction honest reaction what would you notice maybe would you notice the baby as much as you noticed the ornaments or would there be some difference both like an equal proportion maybe we should try this out because most probably we have not done it golden ornaments definitely attracts the eye we may notice the baby too but golden ornaments attracts the eye so the the concept is you should not channelize your energy or aura so much on my child mm-hmm. yeah therefore the child is decorated with those ornaments That's backward thinking, isn't it? Like, come on, <laughs> or and things like that. <laughs> But this is how they would understand what is helpful for the baby. So she came with all of that, and then they, she suggested that let us give him the name Nimai. 
because of certain reasons, the idea was that the baby should always be protected. And Sar, uh, Nilambar Chakravarti, he said, I suggest the name Sri Vishwam. So everyone said, Hari Bol. Maybe they were not trained in a temple, so <laughs> <laughs> they said, Jai, Jai. That is what the Chaitanya Bhagavan says. I'm just repeating the Chaitanya Bhagavan. I wish Vrindavan was Thakura had written, Hari Bol. They said, Jai, Jai. And all glories, all glories. This is so wonderful. In today's times, we can say Hari Bol. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> The ceremony happened, everyone was happy. One day, Mother Sachi, she called Jagannath Mishra, she called out to him. Please, please, please listen. So he came, hearing her cry out, came into the room, and they saw that there were footprints in the room, on the floor. And those prints had the insignia of, they had the insignia, uh, the, the imprint of the insignia, the imprint of the thunderbolt, the imprint of the, all the markings of the chakra and the gada, the club, and the discus. They're like, oh my God, what's this? The flag too, yeah. It's, who's been here? Oh. Uh, before that, when, when there was um, a lot of people coming to see the child, this will be interesting. Maybe I should finish with that. Some demigods who are actually pranksters. <laughs> Do you like demigods who play pranks? So some devotas, you know? <laughs> no, so let them have fun. You know, why should we be the only people who play pranks? <laughs> Some of the devatas who had come there, they love to play pranks. So sometimes, you know, devata have these special suits. When they want, they can turn off the energy of the suit so that they become invisible. Other times they turn it on and they, they are visible. They have that ability. So this particular demigod decided to be invisible. However, he let his shadow be visible. So he walked into the room and people saw a shadow walk into the room. Someone said, Chor, Chor, thief, 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 thief. And everyone said, where, 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 where? Where is the thief? There. I saw a salute. I saw a shadow. Some of the people like, a thief in the house. There's a thief taking advantage of this situation. A thief has come in. Let us catch a thief. If we catch a thief, we are going to teach the thief a lesson. People got excited. People get excited for so many things. They got excited. Somebody else said, maybe it's not a thief. Maybe it's an evil spirit. So they started ch chanting the Ram Raksha. Somebody else started chanting the Devi Raksha Mantras. Somebody else started chanting the Narsimha prayers. Everyone was trying to do their best for the protection of the child and for the protection of everyone else there. And one person walked in and said, where is this evil spirit? I am a ghost buster. <laughs> I am a hoja. This evil spirit will not be able to stay here while I am here in my presence. Run away evil spirit, run away. Meanwhile, the demigod comes and takes blessings of Lord Chaitanya. Lord Gauranga says, hi, bye. So <laughs> the baby is happy to see the demigod. The demigod is happy to receive the glance of the Lord. And the demigod sees that, yeah, I've, I've done my part. Uh, it was a good prank. Now I leave. So they see the shadow leaving. And they, there goes a thief. There goes a thief. There goes a thief. And the ghost buster person says, see my presence. <laughs> <laughs> No evil spirit can stay here in my
my presence. And everyone is like, oh my God, it's such a powerful puja. So, when they see all these footprints, what happened here? Is there an evil spirit in the house? It is going to be an evil spirit because there are auspicious markings. Could it be our child? Not possible. Child is not even able to crawl or to speak of walk. Now, Lord Chaitanya had actually decided to have some fun. Mother Sachi and Jagannath Mishra had put him to rest. He said, all right, I've done enough of resting for at least three or four months. Now I need to have a walk. It's healthy. So he looked at his apple watch. <laughs> the walk. The outdoor walk thing. It was an indoor walk. <laughs> he clicked on the indoor walk and he started walking and he said, let's have some fun. So he left his prints. Mother Sachi comes in, calls for Jagannath Mishra. They call the neighbors. The neighbors are like, oh, you are so fortunate. How is that? I think the Supreme Lord is manifesting his pastimes in this house. They're like, the Supreme Lord? Who's the Supreme Lord? Your Shaligram Shila. Damodar Shila. I think the Damodar Shila is taken on the human form as a baby and is walking around in your house. And Jagannath Mishra says, Sachi Devi, did you hear that? We are so fortunate that the Supreme Lord has come here to bless our house, to bless our child. We should do a festival. So they did a Shaligram Shila happiness festival. And Lord Chaitanya is like, yeah, whatever you want to do, you can do. <laughs> it is good. So in this way, Supreme Lord spent his time in the house of Mother Sachi. <laughs> and the clock said it's time to stop. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, um, any comments? Yes. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, uh, for a wonderful uh, talk. I just want to double click on self restraint uh, part you said, right? Um, does that mean that um, in a situation, a conflicting situation where you think you you could have reacted or you have already reacted, uh, is that necessary? And then we go back and think that about situation that why I reacted in that situation. So just wanted to have a double click on that self restraint part, which you explained. Uh, sometimes it becomes very chaotic uh, in our minds, and it continues to pollute your thoughts uh, again and again. Yes, that's that is um, definitely one way of understanding it. It's a good way of understanding it that we try to analyze and see if we could understand how it happened and what could have avoided it from happening, and uh, was there any other way to handle it? Definitely. And then also meditate on the existential uh, identity. How is it that a servant got involved in that situation? Yeah. Anything else? 
Thinking when to serve them for the Lord hmm. is easier mm -hmm. than thinking when to serve them for the close little hmm. husband, wife, hmm. boss. Hmm. How to do that? How to make it happen there? Because amongst peers and amongst people with whom there could be a like, same level ego, <coughs> it just does not work. <coughs> So, certain situations, it seems impractical uh, to think of, of ourselves as a servant. I, I think maybe what I said was that we have to try and analyze how is it that a servant got involved in a situation like this? Because a servant is uh, always trying to be engaged in service. So there are certain situations according to our uh, status in, uh, in our life where um, time has to be allotted for interpersonal relationships. It has to be. There's no way out because um, we subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. So now we have to pay the subscription fees. So we need it. We will have to uh, allot a certain amount of time in our lives for those interpersonal relationships. And we must try to do it well. You know, whatever um, advice we get or whatever training we have received with the help of that, we must try to do well in those situations so that we do not have to spend more time than it is needed in those interpersonal relationships. Don't, we need not have to drag uh, the, the interactions beyond what is needed. Whether it is the emotion of affection, or if it is the emotion of um, disdain, whatever emotion is there, it shouldn't be stretched beyond its uh, natural limit. So first of all, we have to do it because we have subscribed to them. Secondly, we should uh, be uh, cognizant enough maybe, or maybe we should be aware enough to do what is needed to be done. And how should I be in the mood of serving? No, not... we, have, we haven't come to that as okay. yet. I'm saying that a servant is involved in a situation where a servant would wonder, how is it that I got in, involved in this situation? All right. Mm -hmm. So that is what we have to think whenever uh, we, we are, you know, in the, we are thinking properly. All right. So, uh, Trying to see that we only use the time that is needed for those interactions, we uh, let that time be used. Keep those interactions only to those time intervals. Figure it out. Beyond that, we have to figure out or we have to try and see that the rest of our time we are able to engage in service. So there's nothing we can do about the time that we need to spend in their personal relationships that we have to do, which is sometimes called as our duty. When we say our duty, it means the duty uh, that is prescribed or prescribed duty, the duty that is prescribed according to the subscription that we have accepted. Do it in the most... Uh, let us say, um, what is minimalistic way? Uh, again, I'll stress whether those emotions are of affection, whether those emotions are of happiness or they are of distress. Either ways, we have to do it in a minimalistic way, not stretch it beyond its 
नेचुरल टाइम नीड बेसिकली प्रभुपाद वुड से नॉट बी ओवर वेल बाय द सिचुएशन ओके सो जस्ट डू दैट पार्ट why should we why do we have to do it there's no other way out we cannot before we have paid our subscription fees there's no way out we have to finish that mortgage all right other than that whatever time we have during the day for the rest of our life we should try to see that it does not we do not want to create any more interpersonal interactions than is needed does that make sense so we try to have only interactions we try to have interpersonal interactions that uh, help us uh, remember that we are servants and helps us engage in service you heard this many times but in different words isn't it that do whatever your duty is and don't be attached to it and the rest of the time simply chant hare krishna however it's too simple to be applied so when we speak it in a little more complex way then our brain kind of thinks ah now i understand it better so when we use words like minimalistic don't stretch us beyond don't be overwhelmed those seminars seem to be a little more uh, well spoken of even if there is no conscious of being a survivor right it's purely no consciousness of being a survivor in those interpersonal relationships there may be it may not be the primary understanding still it is all right the reason it is all right is because you are trying to do it uh, to the best of your ability and without wasting time so technically that could be called as good activities what is called as griha dharma or vyavaharik dharma you understand that it is also called as griha dharma vyavaharik dharma which means as a worldly person a person of this world you do your duties to the best of your ability however there is definitely a chance that you may not be always able to remember your identity as a servant so it's all right it's not the best it's not bad now what would be bad is when there are no interactions like that and we are not able to engage in service i didn't get Love. there are, there there will be moments in our life where those in, every day there will be moments where we have time for ourselves if those moments we are not able to engage in service that is bad yeah okay hari krishna did everyone yeah. everyone is on the same thing yeah yes you were talking about uh, self restraint and satisfaction so is there any relation self restraint and satisfaction i said that self restraint means where we understand that we are <clears throat> essentially the servant of the lord so a servant's only business is to serve now when we want to serve there are no expectations other than being engaged in a service and that is not an expectation we just want to what do servants do isn't it so this brings about self restraint in the sense that when there are no extra expectations you don't get agitated either by praise or by harsh words you don't have that facility a servant doesn't have that facility right so that is self restraint when one does that when one has self restraint the mind is peaceful when the mind is peaceful one can be satisfied is that all right so simply doing service keeps us satisfied the, the connecting dots were self restraint mind peaceful and then that is okay. 
Anything else? Okay. I was uh, <clears throat> I was thinking that I was just thinking that uh, that I um, who am I is the servant of um, Krishna. How do we practice that? You know, uh, in the real life, that we just you know twenty four seven, right? So always thinking, just thinking that. But how do we practice that? How do we engage ourselves for that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, sometimes our children they put up dramas. So, what does it take for them to come back to who they are and not play the particular part of that the particular part they have in the drama? What does it take for them to do that? And the drama. When the drama is over, they're back to who they are. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? The act is over. Yeah? yeah. So how do we practice this understanding of stop the drama? Mm -hmm. That is what Prabhupada would say, right? It says that as soon as we realize we are spirit soul, the drama that we are this body is over. The identity that we are this body is over, right? We have a body that is in this body. Now, how should it be used? So we use it for self realization. That's all. Once we know that we have a body, then we use that body for service. But if you think we are the body, then we are wondering how should we do service? Like if I have a spoon, now I know how to use that spoon to serve. But if I think I am the spoon, then I'll be wondering who will pick me up and use me to serve. Mm. <laughs> Makes sense? Mm. <laughs> so I am the person who's supposed to serve and the body is an instrument. Mm. Is that helpful? Yeah. Anything else? No questions on me. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai, Gaurav Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai, Shri Gauranga Mahaprabhu Ki Jai, Anant Koti, Vaishnav Bhakta Vrinda Ki Jai, Tai Gaurav Primanand, Hare Krishna.